on the left shows the percentage of spring wheat uh, that was plant that was hard, that has been harvested. Uh, for the region, between 69 to 96 percent of the planted acreage has been harvested um, across the various states. Uh, this represents a decrease in between 2 to 22 percent less acreage harvested relative to the five-year average. For the area as a whole, 70 Three percent of the spring wheat crop is harvested. This represents a 17 percent uh, decrease relative to this time of the year for the five-year average. Uh, and a lot of this is likely due to wetter field conditions, especially in the Dakotas and eastern Montana, um, as well as North Dakota. Um, moving to the figure on the right, uh, thinking about winter wheat, uh, orange shading, and this is farmers are attempting to get this into the ground right now. Orange shading indicates that the high plain states are behind in planting uh, by between 4 to 11 percent um, of the acreage. In white, Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois are about on schedule, and then Ohio uh, is slightly ahead of the game um, in terms of planting by about 1 percent. Okay. I spent some time and I alluded uh, to farmers keeping their crops in the field to try to reach maturity. Um, one of the major concerns with doing this is that uh, we're coming up to the time when frost can be an issue for crops. Uh, we're moving into the fall. Um, so just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Here I've shown the median uh, date of uh, first freeze. Um, so this is based on the historical record from 1980 to 2010. Uh, and essentially with first freeze uh, set at a threshold of 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, again, this is based on the historical record of the last 30 years from 1980 to 2010. Um, based upon this record, first freeze trends from October 1st to October 31st for the majority of the Midwest. Um, for North Dakota or high, higher latitude states, North Dakota, Montana, and some mountainous areas of Wyoming and Colorado, uh, that first freeze can be on average as early as late September. Um, again, keep in mind this is based on historical observations. Uh, things are very different year to year and that's dependent upon our seasonal weather outlook. Uh, so to the right, just to provide some clarity here, I've given a sneak peek at the one month outlook, outlook produced by the Climate Prediction Center. The outlook does suggest that odds are tilted towards above normal temperatures going into October. October. Uh, and this may help, help to get crops to maturity um, with less worry of a killing frost. I'm going to take a pause and grab a sip of water. Okay, let's move on from our current conditions to the out, outlook for the upcoming week. Um, I've shown here the seven-day quantitative precipitation forecast for the U.S. Uh, shading here uh, represents the depth of expected precipitation um, that we would expect in inches uh, for the next seven days. The expected values, if you look at this map, uh, in our region uh, range from about a tenth of an inch in green and light green to upward of five inches in red. Okay, uh, So the key area that I'm sure all of your eyes are drawn to right now um, is a storm system that's forecast to drop between 1.5 upwards of five inches of rainfall across the Midwest in the next seven days. Um, again, 1.5 to five inches of rainfall denoted by the uh, blue to purple to dark red shading uh, in the Midwestern region. Um, so this area extends in a swath starting from Oklahoma, moving north to Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Iowa, and Illinois. Uh, there is also a band of higher precipitation between 2.5 and down to one inch extending from uh, North Dakota down to central uh, eastern South Dakota. Um, it's going to be important to keep an eye on how this develops as much of the Midwest uh, and the upper Missouri River Basin is still very wet, um, especially uh, where floodwaters remain high along the James uh, River Basin in South Dakota. Okay. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the upcoming week's flood forecast uh, and keep in mind those seven-day precipitation totals. Here I've shown the flood forecast centers uh, projected flooding from today extending through September 28th. Um, purple symbols represent areas of major flooding, red represents areas of moderate flooding, and orange symbols indicate minor flooding. As expected, the additional rainfall in the Dakotas is uh, going to contribute
contribute uh, to major flooding along the James River and Big Soy Rivers above Sioux City. Um, they are currently at flood stage and are expected to stay that way uh, with this additional rainfall. For the lower portions of the upper Mississippi, uh, the rainfall is not expected to contribute to major river impacts as most of the gauges in the area are already below major flood state. Um, the precipitation in this area is also going to be spread out over a two to three day period. So not all of that depth of water associated with the seven day map is gonna fall in one time period. It'll be spread out over a, between a two to three day time period um, for the region. Okay, so Moving on to our uh, longer term outlook, or moving into a longer term outlook, let's take a look at the eight to 14 day outlook. Um, generally, generally, surface low pressure is anticipated to form across the Rockies, and this is gonna shift eastward during week two. Uh, the NOAA Climate Prediction Center's eight to 14 day outlook suggests a storm tract I just discussed, uh, again, within the seven day outlook. Um, so, on the figure on the right, temperatures are expected to be above normal for the majority of the region. Um, and this is indicated by orange to red shading um, on the figure to the left. Montana and western Wyoming are tilted towards uh, equal chances of, of above, below normal uh, temp temperatures. Um, and as we move further into Montana and Wyoming, uh, we, we may expect uh, odds to be tilted towards below normal temperatures. In the figure to the right, green shading indicates that the majority of the region is expected to be, and all of the region is expected to be above normal um, for precipitation. In addition, southern portions of the Midwest can expect um, above normal precipitation. Odds are tilted towards below normal uh, precipitation for Kentucky and a small portion of Ohio. So thinking of that eight to 14 day outlook, uh, it's also important to think about the potential hazards related to the above normal precipitation and the low pressure forecast uh, for that eight to 14 day time period. Um, again, I've shown a CPC hazards model outlook. Uh, these models are indicating increased chances for heavy precipitation across the Midwest um, associated with that high rainfall area in the seven week forecast. Um, but heavy precipitation across the Midwest during the week two period, um, a slight risk of heavy precipitation with three day rainfalls totals reaching or exceeding one inch uh, is highlighted across parts of the Central Plains, upper and middle uh, Mississippi uh, River Valley for September 26th to 30th. Um, so within a three day, excuse me, four day period. Uh, the expected heavy rainfall may exacerbate or prolong flood conditions in the Missouri River Basin as well. Uh, in addition to the forecast for heavy rainfall across parts of the Midwest, surface low pressure over the Rockies and Great Plains supports a risk of high winds across parts of the Great Plains, and this will happen between September 26th to the 28th. Uh, this could present problems for mature crops uh, um, that could experience grain loss associated with the high winds. Um, I'd highlight further west that there is some potential for cold temps and freezing at the higher elevations of Monta in Montana and Wyoming, so essentially mountainous, more mountainous regions and high elevation regions in those western states. Okay, looking past the uh, 8 to 14 day outlook, it's important to consider the El Nino Southern Oscillation um, and changes in uh, Pacific Ocean sea surface temperatures. In some cases, these can impact regional air circulation patterns and in turn air temperatures and uh, our local precipitation uh, dynamics. Um, in this case, it's not as important, I guess is what I should say. Uh, shown the early September ENSO forecast in this figure, gray bars indicate the probability of ENSO neutral conditions. Um, so neutral conditions are favored through the fall at approximately a 75% chance. And this is really expected to, to continue until the spring of 2020 with a 55 to 60% chance. Um, so what I'd say overall is that ENSO neutral conditions uh, make it a bit more difficult to forecast temperature and precipitation conditions uh, moving into the winter months. Um, so ENSO is not expected to play a, a big role in uh, uh, the forecast moving forward. 
so moving to that forecast, uh, let's take a look at the one month outlook. And I've already shown the temperature map for this. Uh, but, you know, in general, I'd say wet soil conditions and the Madden Julian oscillation played a slight role in the uh, in the uh, uh, prediction here. Um, the one month temperature outlook on the left uh, shows that the entirety of the region, uh, as well as the United States as a whole, is in red. Uh, this indicates that we're tilted towards warmer than average October temperatures in general. Uh, it's going to be important to keep an eye on this, as I highlighted, uh, as warmer temp temperatures are needed for crop development um, and to prevent those the early freeze for crops that do stay in the ground. Moving on to the figure to the right, equal chances of uh, above normal, below normal, or average precipitation uh, are expected for the vast majority of the the region in October, and this is really associated with a bit of uncertainty in the precipitation forecast. Uh, portions of northern Minnesota may uh, be tilted towards above average precipitation, uh, and the odds are tilted towards below normal precipitation in Oklahoma and portions of southern Kansas and Missouri. Okay, so going a bit further to the three-month outlook, uh, so from October, November uh, through December, again, uh, if we look at temperature, the entirety of the region is covered in red, and this is suggests above average uh, fall to winter, moving into winter temperatures. What I'll highlight here is that uh, the official winter forecast uh, is going to come out next month, October 17th. Uh, from the CPC. So uh, come back to this and take a look if you're interested and concerned, as we all are, about uh, our winter precipitation um, and what this winter is going to look like. Uh, moving to the figure on the right, uh, you're going to you'll notice a large green swath uh, extending from Montana, Montana and Wyoming, uh, and this goes in a southeasterly direction across the Upper Missouri River region, uh, as well as into uh, Colorado and Kansas. Across this region, precipitation is expected to be above normal. Uh, remaining areas of the, the region are expected to have equal chances of above normal, normal, or below normal precipitation, as indicated by the white shading. Okay, so thinking about the uh, seasonal outlook, I think two positive or a glasses half full perspective on uh, wet conditions include uh, both drought and our fire potential moving into the fall. Uh, you know, drought and fire are not really expected to be significant issues in the upcoming months. Uh, on the left, I've shown the Climate Prediction Center's uh, drought outlook for October through uh, December. Um, excuse me. Maybe I haven't shown that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, October through December. Um, you know, front, frontal activity and cooler weather are predicted to result in drought improvement generally uh, and removal across the current drought areas of the Midwest and also northeastern North Dakota. In the south, drought improvement will likely occur in Oklahoma and into southwestern Kansas. Um, drought is expected to generally persist in some of these areas. To the right is the outlook for the wildland fire potential in October. Uh, enhanced moisture conditions have maintained and will continue to maintain uh, litter and fuel moistures, so no significant wildland fires expected across the region. So wrapping it all up, uh, and just to summarize this long presentation today, uh, you know, in, in general, it's been historically wet and cooler than normal. Um, our record-setting floods across the region are beginning to climb, but may pick up again with the ante anticipated wet weather forecast in the next 14 days. Uh, especially stay, stay tuned in the upper Missouri River Basin, where they're still reeling from floodwaters associated with last weekend's event. Uh, significant agricultural impacts uh, do have been seen due to the record weather conditions. Um, and warmer weather is needed in the next couple of weeks for maturation of crops that made it did make it into the ground. Uh, the one-month and three-month outlooks suggest above normal warmth. It's so unlikely with these that we'd experience or we can expect early frosts across the region. Excuse me, unlikely that we might experience those early uh, killing frosts. Precipitation odds are uncertain for the next month, uh, but tilted towards wetter conditions over the next three months for the upper Missouri region. Uh, significant drought and wildfire conditions are unlikely to develop for the majority of the region. So with that, I'll wrap it up, and I just wanted to present 
fly think, today's uh, presentation and some links. Kelsey, I want to. I'm going to interrupt you just for a second, only sure. because yeah. So we just got some information in the last <laughs> literally five minutes, uh, <laughs> and I want. Yeah, I, 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 sorry to do that to interrupt like that, oh, but um, I, before people start jumping off and all that stuff, um, it's probably incumbent on us to, if you go back to your hazards map, please, next two weeks, outlook and all that business. Yep. Yeah, so the the folks that look at this stuff and put this information on the Climate Prediction Center uh, has just uh, enhanced the probability of heavy rain falling over an area, and I, I hope people I hope people look at that web page down at the very bottom uh, later today. It might be out now, but you could also uh, access it a little bit later if it's not there uh, to see the new area, which is similar to this, but it has an enhanced um, let's say enhanced probability of 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 heavy rain. Is, this is a slight risk. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to get into some terms here, but this is a slight risk of heavy precipitation. So it's saying, hey, you know, we're looking at this. It could be a, could be a situation where we get heavy rain over, you know, a lake. You know, basically that whole area is already too wet. Um, so now uh, they've upped the probability a bit to say it's a moderate chance from slight. Okay. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail about what that means, except that there's more confidence that uh, the period of next, not this weekend, even though it's going to rain this weekend too, um, that next weekend there's going to be a, a, a good chance of that same area, maybe a little bit expanded uh, area of getting uh, of, over an inch of, of rain, and uh, of course that wouldn't be good. So that's so why I'm butting in. To give you the latest uh, but, um, but Doug, hazard outlook. This is Dennis. Let me modify. The location is not exactly the same location. Right. It has shifted eastward and southward a little bit. So western South Dakota is not included, but a little bit more of Nebraska and much of Iowa. And actually all of Iowa are included now. Right. That's right. Yeah, you'll I'll see it on the take next point yeah. to update this map and include that figure. Oh yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, you know, I could probably bring what I what I might do is just bring it up right now and then take back control. See if I can do that. Sure. Any any luck? I'm going to get rid of a couple things. If you don't care about this, feel free to get off the. Uh, <laughs> actually, Western South Dakota is in the slide still. A much larger area is in the slide, Dennis. Okay. Um, we should get to questions me, uh, too, Doug. Yep, I don't think there are there weren't any. Um there's a couple coming in now. Hold on a second. Let me just take back this uh presentation. How do we do it? Me. That would be show my screen. Okay, there's nothing there, right? So I'm gonna show you Nope. I'm gonna show you this. Yeah. So that's the new area of what they call a hazard, meaning uh uh, moderate risk of heavy precipitation is the darker green, slight risk of heavy precipitation in the light green. Doesn't mean that whole area is going to get it, just means that there's a higher confidence and confidence that area is um, sort of under the gun in terms of precipitation. This does not take into account current conditions on the ground, so it doesn't matter that that area is already having flooding issues or saturated soils. This is purely looking at the weather and, and climate and saying, this is what the systems are going to do. Okay? Just want, I want to point that out. All right. Now, let me get to the questions. There are a couple here, or comments at least. Um, stand by. Yeah, let me, while you're doing that, Doug, let me throw yeah. in. I just, I just received a message from one of our, our listeners who's a, uh, a station manager at a radio station in Yankton, and another impact was noted that they have had to reduce power because their transmitter location was uh, underwater or surrounded by water. So they had to go to generator power and onto a, a backup. Uh, a backup. They are a clear channel station, so they're a high power AM station. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so one of the commenters or one of the questions, I, I guess, is uh, uh, the several studies have indicated uh, wetter trends in the upper Missouri, ba Missouri Basin in South Central Canada for the next several decades. So I wonder why there's a little talk amongst professionals about um, setting f flood levees further from the river and giving more room uh, to spread out. Um, sure, uh, yeah, a lot of complicating, complicated issues with that. Um, that issue, uh, uh, a lot of private lands and such down there that have to be, uh, 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 that people have to start thinking about, I suppose, more. Um, yeah, um, and then, oh, and then <laughs> a thanks to David Pearson, who actually works for uh, the National Weather Service and NOAA uh, out of uh, Omaha for his good work. I don't know if David's on or not. Um, and then some more comments about how uh, good presentation. What's the significance of a 28 degree freeze? Tell us that, Dennis, or Kelsey. I mean, 32 or 28, what's so important about that magical 28 degrees temperature? That's a USDA question, Dennis. <laughs> gotcha. The, tw the 28 Fahrenheit is typically where we consider a hard freeze that will kill off all row crops, um, corn and soybeans. Uh, at 32 or even above 32, more sensitive horticultural plants may be damaged or killed. Uh, so you, you, it's it's very crop specific. Um, there's also an issue of how long you're at certain events. You know, if you have a row crop that's at 30 degrees for six hours or something like that, may that may also freeze it. But 28 is typically where we consider that that uh, corn and soybeans are done. Uh, wheat, depending on its its uh, its stage, can survive at a at a at a colder temperature than that. But uh, 28 is what we consider our hard freeze. So. Um... The next question, I'm trying to hurry along here, uh, the next and last question that we have, uh, really asks, with the wet soils and current flooding, um, and I'll add the reservoir levels and everything else, um, how much does that enhance spring flooding, out, uh, flink, spring flooding chances? And of course it does. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, some of this moisture that we've already received, and it looks like we're going to be receiving, um, and I'll say mainly in the Missouri, but also in the uh, upper Mississippi, looks like, uh, it, you know, it's not going to evaporate quickly. And once we freeze, I think that was mentioned earlier, uh, once we freeze pretty hard, it's going to sort of, and, and plants die and everything else, evaporation is going to be a little bit less as well. So um, we're going to lock in here pretty, pretty wet, right? It uh, doesn't really matter what we do. Um, as humans to try to get rid of some of that water to some degree. Obviously, the reservoirs can be drawn down, but um, the soil, there's nothing we can do about that. So it's gonna lock in fairly wet. So uh, so yeah, uh, I would say there are enhanced, uh, there will be enhanced uh, spring flooding chances. Um, we'll have to see, obviously, what happens in the next few months and into the spring. Uh, hopefully, we don't set up like we did last year where it was also very wet uh, leading into to, uh, spring last year. Any other comments yeah, along just, those lines? Just to add to that, I, you know, I think it's key to keep track of the moisture conditions, soil moisture conditions through local monitoring networks. Uh, our groundwater levels are really high too. And that's another component. Yep. Uh, yep. But, you know, I think that's really the, the goal moving forward. Um, and I tried to convey that, but is to evacuate a lot of that stored water that's flood water right now uh, within our reservoir so that when we come to next spring with wet conditions or likely wet conditions and lots of runoff um, because of wet soils that we've got the capacity for that runoff um, and, and reduce those peaks in our reservoirs. Yes. Yeah. The other thing that uh, we have heard from a number of folks, not only are we breaking, we're breaking records in sort of the wrong time of year, uh, especially in eastern South Dakota. We thought we had the records pretty much set there uh, this spring, and a number of records were set. Well, this because it's raining now, and it's you know it's a considerable rainfall. Don't get me wrong, but it's certainly not 10, 15 inches of rain. We're breaking records again in September, um, which is 
which is a little bit uh, unusual in terms of the climatology of when you'd expect that to happen. We're also uh, exceeding runoff records uh, by quite a bit, especially uh, in the stretch uh, below Gavin's Point to Sioux City. Um, that record will be exceeded very likely or has been uh, by a considerable amount. And um, we're, we're uh, the estimate for this year's upper basin runoff at Sioux City, which includes, of course, eastern South Dakota rivers, uh, is somewhere around, I think, 58.8 million acre feet. And that may not mean a lot to everybody, but what does mean a lot is in 2011, 61 million acre feet uh, uh, came through that stretch uh, on an annual basis. So uh, we're approaching the uh, 2011 numbers. We don't know if we'll get there or not uh, at this point. We don't think so, but we'll ha again have to see what happens uh, over the next uh, next few weeks. Really, I mean, October is the biggest. Uh, it's probably the last big month of normal, normally, when we can see uh, a lot of precipitation. After that, things begin to dry out somewhat. You get more snow and less precipitation, you know, through, let's just say, November through February, and then we kind of crank up again as moisture sort of moves back into the area. That said, we've seen heavy rainfalls and precipitation events in those winter months as well in portions of the basin. So. Uh, it's uh, it's a situation. <laughs> Dennis? Yeah, a couple more things. We also have to monitor. We didn't talk about the winter outlook in the way of potential snowfall. No. Uh, that would be another issue in the way of spring flooding. On the ag side, we you know we're talking about runoff on, on the on the runoff and flood side. On the ag side, wet soils pretty much stay wet. Um, excess water, the water that's in the pore space and soils can drain off and there's a lot of drain tile that will allow that to drain off, but soils are still at field, going to be at field capacity holding about the amount of moisture they can. Uh, that won't change much. We can evaporate near the surface, but without too much active growing, we can't remove that soil, the moisture deeper in the soil moisture profile. So it's likely to stay with us and that puts us at higher risk of, of slow planting starting next year. All right, Kelsey. Any any final comments or? Um, I don't mind. You want to? Okay. Hey, thank you, you did a fantastic job. I want to say that publicly. I I want to thank you very much. Um, uh, I think you gave a lot of information over a very short period of time, and I think the audience. I hope the audience benefited from that um, quite a bit. So. Thanks, Thanks everybody again. for. Uh, listening. <laughs> we will be back uh, by for sure on October 17th. You may hear, if you're on uh, sort of my email list or Dennis's or whatever, we may be, depending upon what goes on in the next uh, uh, few days and weeks, uh, we may be sending out some further information. I don't know if we'll have another webinar or not. really depends on uh, 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 depends on what Mother Nature provides us. I guess we could say it that way. <laughs> So, Meaning an, another special webinar. We will have our normal. It webinar. would have to be a yeah. It would have to be a special webinar stuck in the middle between uh, this one and the last one. And again, if you're not on uh, on our list, uh, you send me an email, Doug dot Cluck at Noah dot Gov, and uh, I'll get you on that list. Most of you are, but thank you. And at that. I think I'm going to conclude the uh, webinar and say thank you very much for all that attended, all your questions and your interest. Have a great weekend and uh, take care.